to Michael. Okay, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event, uh, event for uh, inviting me here uh, to talk about, um, I think the title is somehow, how can we get out of this crisis. I'm not going to uh, describe to you the crisis. I'm not going to describe to you the effects of austerity. Uh, uh, I mean, if we don't already know it now, then we're in a lot of trouble. I'm actually going to, uh, I'm actually going to present three very simple interrelated steps that I believe that can address aspects of the crisis which did not just arise in the last few years, but which are deeply rooted in the Irish economy. So that we can identify those points, come up with concrete uh, rep proposals in the short term that can win over workers to a program, but that can launch us in a, direct, in a different direction in the long term. And, and you can tell me how successful I've been at doing that. Uh, I want to make, uh, so I'll start with the first one, which is investment. I mean, we, we all know the absolute importance of investment in driving employment and driving the productive capacity of the economy to grow in the future. Everyone has to do it in order, everyone has to do it in order uh, for, our, uh, for future revenue. Households do it, businesses do it, states do it. Now, there are a few celebrity economists that go around sneering, mocking, uh, uh, the idea of public investment, uh, saying that we don't need it, it would be a waste and all that. When, when we look at the landscape and we see that we're in an investment-starved economy. Why is that? It's not based on any type of economic logic. It's based on a political logic. And what is that political logic? Very simply, what does investment do? It creates assets. Assets that generate revenue in the future. Public investment creates public assets. But if you are one of those who believes that the state should be shrunk, the public sector should be outsourced and privatized, and that workers should be slapped around and disciplined and told they shouldn't be making so much money, the last thing you want to do is give ownership of revenue generating assets to the public sector. Their, uh, their opposition is founded on purely a political and not an economic uh, diagnosis. Now, of course, we could turn to uh, that most bourgeois, bourgeois economist, Lord Maynard Keynes. Uh, somebody who said that, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, he couldn't vote for the Labour Party because he couldn't betray his class. Uh, interesting in his analysis, uh, he discovered that uh, he could not trust capitalists to invest in the capitalist economy. And therefore, he called for the socialization of investment, and there he stopped. I don't think he could go any further than that because the implications were too profound. Because, you know, if capitalists can't be trusted to invest in the capitalist economy, well, what other agency? What other class? And if they can't be trusted to do that, what other things might not be trusted to do? Well, let's just, you know, pocket that and actually turn to the Irish situation. And what I think is one of the most profound little notes that were written at the beginning of the crisis, Davy Stockbrokers, not exactly the most revolutionary left-wing group you can imagine, but they wrote a three-and-a-half-page note at the start of the crisis uh, entitled Years of High Income Largely Wasted. And what they showed was that in the decade preceding the crisis, Private sector investment was almost completely wasted. It was a waste of time, they said. It was just, you might as well have stuck a, a, a match to it, which is essentially what the crisis did. Uh, and they actually went on to say that the only agency that engaged in productive investment was the public sector. Therefore, that means that, to my mind, is one of the stronger arguments to suggest vindicating what capitalists, uh, enlightened capitalists and socialists are saying you can't rely on the private sector uh, to drive investment uh, uh, in, the, in a market economy. Uh, and therefore, the first step is uh, to drive public sector uh, investment. That leads us to the second related issue, that of banking. Because banking plays a role in investment. Banking has a very simple utility function. So take all that stuff away, it's very simple. Banks house assets our cash, we go and you know, we need cash, and then they take those assets and lend it out to the uh, uh, lend it out to households, businesses, and states, so they can create more assets, which in turn means they house more assets. They can lend out, and there you go. That's the simple function that banks should be doing. How does that work? How's that been working in the Irish economy over the last few decades? The late minister for finance, when he was introducing the NAMA bill, said that we had to create NAMA, take the toxic assets out of the bank's balance in order to ensure that Irish banks would go back to doing what they did before the crisis, 
which was to lend into the productive economy. I tell you, I fell off my chair when I heard this. I mean, I laughed so long and loud I couldn't hear the rest of his speech. Uh, when has Irish banking ever in, had a relationship with the productive economy? I'll give you three examples. Miles Nagopoli, a.k.a. Flann O'Brien, a.k.a. Brian Nolan, he wrote back actually during a bank teller strike in the 1950s. He said there was no such thing as an Irish bank. Now, at that time, there was tons of banks. There was the Munster Bank and a Leinster Bank, much more, much more banks. But he said there was no such thing as an Irish bank. Why? He said because an Irish bank would take the deposits of workers and farmers and then lend it back out to Irish businesses and uh, Irish households. But that's not what they did. They took the deposits all right. But of course, then they went off and bought UK treasury securities and the like. And latterly, if anybody's come across Con Conor McCabe's great book, Sins, uh, Sins of Our Fathers, then in the 1970s, they engaged in speculative activities, which meant every once in a while, we would have a commercial property boom and bust, a housing boom and bust, leading up to, to the last one. In the 1970s, banks were missing. They did not invest uh, into uh, the uh, newly created uh, Irish indigenous manufacturing base. The studies showed that, you know, uh, it wasn't banks, it wasn't actually venture capitalists, it wasn't even that, it was the Irish state. The Irish state invested. That's where they got the money from. And actually, our, our central governor, our, uh, the governor of the central bank, Patrick Conahan, before he became governor, wrote recently, in the last few years, that uh, where were the banks during the first phase of the Celtic Tiger boom? <coughs> nowhere. Nowhere. They were never involved. Irish banks have never fulfilled the simple utility function. So I have a very simple proposal for number two, and that is that we actually nationalize the banks. Now, you might think that's an odd thing since we own the banks. Uh, no, we don't own the banks. We own the bank debt. What we are is we are temporary concierges in the lobby, and we open the door when the senior executives walk in and the prospective buyers of the banks in the future, the venture capitalists, the vulture capitalists, whatever. We take their phone calls and we book their, book their dinners in the gentlemen's club. And what is going to happen is we are going to take that debt onto our books in order to clean them up so that we can sell them back to the same class of people who got us into the mess in the first place. So I would suggest nationalizing the banks. And actually, again, we can look back in history. What did one of the Irish governments do in the 1930s? If you're into this kind of thing, I would suggest you go back and read the dull debates uh, over the industrial setting up of the Industrial Credit Corporation, which was a state bank. Uh, you actually take whole swathes of that debate, you could apply it here. Just change some of the wording, change some of the references and all that. What they had was the same thing, a credit crisis. They couldn't get credit into the economy. They didn't set up NAMA back then. They didn't do tax incentives and all that. They actually set up a public bank. So we can do the same thing. We can set up a public investment bank, and we can keep one of the covered banks uh, in public uh, uh, ownership, in public enterprise ownership. And through those two banks, we can begin to drive credit and capital into the economy. My third point, and again, it's related. Uh, OK, so let's say we've got this public investment. Well, any investment resources. And now we've got a couple of banks that are ready to you know, lend that credit out. We are ready to rock. We are going to invest in this economy, put people back to work, grow the economy. The problem is we have a third problem. Who's going to do it? Um, who is actually going to take this investment, actually set up the enterprise, put the people to work to produce the goods and services that other people want to buy, both here and abroad? I'll give you an example. In about 1926, we had 120 electricity suppliers in this country. Uh, this was a liberal market uh, 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 nirvana. You know, we had competition, we had a liberal market, we had all these things. 120 electricity suppliers. Uh, the problem is no one had electricity. 15% of buildings were electrified. So even coming to Gale, coming to Gale, probably the most right-wing government we ever had, so admittedly, this government is kind of, you know, kind of competing for that top prize. Even they said, enough's enough. We have to set up a public enterprise to roll out electricity to every building in this country. And that's what they did. And in the debates, again, if you want to read them, I, I read these things, but that's because I don't have much of a social life. Um, they were called Bolsheviks. They were called Bolsheviks 
because they did a very practical thing. They said, listen, there's no way we can rely on public enterprise, I'm sorry, private enterprise, we have to set up a state company to do that. And that has been the story of Irish indigenous enterprise. The story of Irish enterprise, the history of it, is the failure uh, of indigenous enterprise. And if you look through, down the years, what state the governments had to do, not for ideological purposes, but for purposes of necessity, they had to set up public enterprises in utilities, in industry, in natural resources, banking and insurance, communication, uh, and air, sea, and land transport. It is not too much to say that public enterprise laid the foundations of a modern Irish economy. Uh, now, we have one of the most weak, with weakest indigenous uh, sectors in Europe, uh, again, uh, and Conor McCabe charts this, our local bourgeoisie have been much happier uh, uh, taking investment and with that buying up land and building houses rather than building enterprise. So, uh, simple solution. Expand public enterprise. Build public enterprise. Expand the existing ones and create new ones. Uh, even one of the parties in government before the election said they wanted to set up six public enterprises to drive their investment program. It wasn't Labour, by the way. Uh, it was Fine Gael. Now, I, I don't know where all that's gone, but, you know. So if we want next generation broadband network, don't incentivize, don't, you know, don't, don't kind of subsidize them with these kind of, you know, uh, cheap loans or something like that. Create a public enterprise company to do that. You want renewable energy? Let ESB and board gas off the hook. Uh, you want to develop our natural resources? Onshore, offshore and onshore, create a public enterprise company that will steward that process in the most efficient and socially advantageous manner. But let's expand our idea of public enterprises, not just about big utilities and kind of big, big sectors and all that. I mean, in the US, Canada, and Europe, wherever you go, you find a myriad of what are local public enterprises. They can somebody be called municipal enterprises, and they are into a number of things. Not just parking lots. Uh, uh, they're into child care centers, local and specialized public transports. They're into coffee shops, bakeries, uh, cinemas, sporting clubs. Uh, they're even into real estate. You actually have municipal enterprise companies that sell real estate. In other words, this again has been uh, uh, an attempt to either ensure that in these local communities, economic activity is being generated in, a, in a, what I would call a democratic and publicly accountable way, and the failure uh, 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 of public enterprises. So therefore, <coughs> wherever there is a need, wherever there's an economic or social need that needs to be fulfilled, and wherever there's people who are there waiting to produce the goods and services to fulfill that need, that's where we should develop public enterprises at a national, local, uh, and regional level. And I'll just conclude. Does all this add up to a socialist economy? No, no, it doesn't. Public investment, public banking, public enterprises, they still operate within capitalist market relationships. And they're going to for some time. However, this is the thing. In the first instance, they operate to a different logic. They don't operate to the logic of private, short-term shareholder value. They, are, they can, its potential is to operate to the logic of social value with profits performing their social utility function, which is quite simply to pay for the cost of capital and to reinvest, and reinvest to create more social wealth, uh, et cetera, and so that we have a virtuous cycle going upwards. These three simple steps, and listen, there's much more, because I only have a few, but I have no time left at all, do I? A couple of minutes. Yeah. Oh, a couple of minutes. Uh, I mean, we could talk about a number of things. We could talk about things at the European level. We could talk about economic democracy, <clears throat> that terrible D word. You know, workers are supposed to just take their brains out uh, uh, and park them at the door before they go inside to go work. You know, uh, they're not allowed to think and work, and they're certainly not allowed to speak. They can't even join a trade union, for crying out loud, or if they do, employers don't have to, to, to recognize them. Uh, so there's a number of other things that we talk about. I'm not saying these are the three most important things, but in the time that I had, uh, uh, I, I think that these are ones which do three things, as I said at the beginning. They address problems in the Irish economy which predate the crisis. Secondly, I think they're capable of winning common sense, the common sense ground, and therefore winning the, you know, more and more workers to this. Because there's, they, there's what, some of them are what we've done already, and it worked in the past. Uh, and thirdly, I think it can actually begin to show 
an alternative road, an alternative road out of the crisis, not one based on austerity and relying on private capital, but one that says, yes, we can do this. We can do this if we rely on our own resources, our own skills, uh, uh, and if we, if we rely on a strong working class to begin the long road to the socialist transformation of the Irish economy. Thank you. I'm presuming most people in the room would be uh, reasonably amenable to what we just heard in terms of, you know, I, I doubt they're actually simple steps, but steps that would actually take more control for people uh, to socialise key functions of an economy, whether it be banking or investment. That's all very important. But I think I'd rather start from a more profound look at what the capitalist economy is in terms of human social relations and not just start from the idea that we should somehow try to solve a crisis which may then allow capitalism to recover. I would like to think, do we want to actually have a system that allows capitalism to recover in terms of human development? And I suppose what Richard and, and other speakers said last night was ultimately that we need a social revolution and the social revolution is really based on masses of ordinary people taking collectively more control of the important decisions in their lives and breaking the link that ties the fate of ordinary people to the needs of accumulating capital. And so it's that crucial link that I would like to look at, whether we want to break that link or whether that link is rational from the point of view of human development. And I suppose in a system based on accumulating capital, the metric of logic or the metric of, of social rationality is accumulating profits. In other words, profitability becomes the metric of whether or not something is, is usually undertaken. And so from that point of view, profit becomes the motive. And actually, in some sense, what that really says is the logic or the, the metric of rationality is can one class of people exploit another class of people at a significantly high enough level to engage in production? That's effectively the, the metric of logic in a capitalist economy. And so, for me, you know, any system that works on that basis is irrational from the point of human development. And so, for me, it's problematic in some ways to try and find solutions which get back to a sort of an equilibrium that allows the economy to grow. You know, that's not to say, and we haven't even mentioned the, the, the natural limits of a capitalist economy that continually, do we really want to get back to growth for growth's sake is another question. But I think to frame it that way helps in terms of orienting the discussion away from sort of technical fixes, which we can debate in the discussion, to more political discussions is what, where I'd like to start. And I suppose because of that, though, obviously you need concrete analysis as well. And so I, like Michael, would see my sort of concrete analysis as what Trotsky would call transitional demands, okay? But there is a very important distinction, I'm not sure whether I'm drawing it between me and Michael or between me and other reformists or me and Keynes, whoever. The point is, in terms of what I see as transitional demands, these are economic concrete demands, which again, like Michael said, are ones that you can win workers to, but actually challenge the logic of the relationship between capital and labour. So in other words, the basis of these transitional demands is not to reassert and reproduce the capitalist system, in other words, to iron out the, uh, the sort of irrational in, <coughs> non-equilibrium elements of a capitalist economy, but to continually put pressure on capital and to build organisational capacity for workers and to build up confidence of working people so that they can go for the next round of reforms that eventually move towards uh, the overthrow of uh, the capitalist system. And I think that's a massively important distinction in terms of the, you know, the, the, the types of demands that you would put. So from there, I suppose, just to get me thoughts. Yeah, I mean, Keynes, you see, I mean, Michael spoke about Keynes there just very briefly. What Keynes was, was a bourgeois economist, as we've heard. And effectively what he was trying to do was see this system on, in its internal workings gets itself into all sorts of problems. You know, the rich get richer so quickly that they save too much and don't invest. That's the point that they are afraid to invest. Money becomes this universal, uh, almost like Frodo's ring in Lord of the Rings. Everybody wants money and it makes money quite expensive in the system. And basically he felt that in order to have the system working rationally, you need to reproduce labour power in a way that allows the capitalists to go on investing and you need the state to step in and help. And so really what Keynes was about was finding ways of stabilising the instability of the capitalist system in the interests of the capitalist class. That's effectively what I would say. And some of the solutions would be making things like make money very cheap. So if you look at what the capitalist class have done in the system so far, they've had long-term refinancing operations which drives down interest rates, the price of money, to very, very low levels. And we've had massive amounts 
of Keynesian monetary policy, actually, all throughout this crisis. That's what we've had. We've also had massive state intervention, whether it be to save banks or to stimulate the American economy, to reorient the Chinese economy towards investment when the crisis broke. So there has actually been quite a lot of Keynesian-type uh, solutions to the crisis tried by bigger powers, albeit in Europe, there was the, mostly the narrative has been around austerity, but they have uh, stepped in to save the banks and so on and so forth. So I think that some of what Keynes would have said about how to solve the crisis, it's not really true that it's all been just a neoliberal austerity drive. The logic of the system has been for austerity for working people, but they also need to try and save the system. And so if they think they can make money cheap for capitalists to reinvest, they'll definitely do that. So there's a sort of a hybrid mix of what's going on. But even, I mean, around that, the real key problem, I think, with the kind of analysis that we're, we're hearing in terms of these three key simple steps is actually our analysis, or at least my analysis would say, that the fundamental problem in the capitalist system is actually an over-accumulation of capital. That's the key problem. So the idea that you will solve a problem of over-accumulation of capital by having a more rational supply of capital again, it's just for me, it's not going to work. I mean, the point really is the state can do all sorts of things. It can step in, it can help, it can sort of, you know, it can smooth out some of the, the, the problems. And it's true that in America, Obama's uh, stimulus have uh, stabilised the economy to a certain extent, but I don't think they've solved the crisis in any way, shape or form. Really, for me, the only solution to, that, to the crisis in terms of technical solutions is a destruction of capital values. That's really the, the solution, and that's not in the, the gift of the state to do. Now, I mean, from the point of view of, of ordinary human social relations, is it true that we could have an economy that had more public banking, that had more public enterprise and so on? Yes, but I've already said that the metric of rationality in capitalism is profitability. And it's the health of profits that really matters in terms of solving crises. And I don't think that state-led investment is going to actually solve a crisis of profitability for the system and allow the capitalist class to get back to profitability. Because even uh, Michael knows this himself, Keynes had this vision that the capitalist economy, even with all its irrationalities built in, was ultimately an economy based on providing consumption for the people in society. And so he saw any problem that led to the, irra his, the sense of irrationality Keynes saw was, for the first time in human history, we have a potential to have more useful goods and services produced than the capitalist economy is actually producing. So it's not a natural constraint based on a lack of technological ability, it's a social constraint based on the relations of capitalism. But because he wanted to save the system, he was never willing to put forward solutions that would actually challenge the power of capital. So he had this sort of wishy-washy analysis that said, over the longer period, the very long period, we may have to socialise investment, and over the longer period, we'll eventually have so much capital that it will be the death of the capitalist rentier class, there'll be no uh, rents for any capitalists, and effectively all they'll get is a, a normal return which just allows them to manage capital. Now for me this is ludicrous nonsense. The idea that the capitalist class are going to progressively reform the system to eliminate themselves is nonsense. And actually history set has shown that the only Keynesian type solutions in terms of stimulus are usually around the means of destruction rather than the means of consumption. You know, if you look at where they, they tended to think, where they tended to go, they usually tended to go in terms of building up military spending because that's obviously key for competition in the system, rather than building up massive amounts of public spending. Albeit that there was, and Michael has quite rightly pointed out, that public investment has been a massive part of a capitalist economy moving on. But just I've got five more minutes, so I want to move away from the general picture to the Irish picture. These technical problems weren't there, even if the you know we could actually solve the crisis through technical Keynesian solutions, it's just not possible politically. You know, even the technical solutions run up against political limits because the Irish ruling class is a particularly spineless group of people who have, since the 1950s, given up really all hope of building an Irish capitalism on the base of autonomous uh, internal development. And, you know, whether it be the Export Board, whether it be the, uh, the IDA, whether it be the Shannon Free Trade Zones, whether it be the neoliberalisation of the economy, whether it be the really low level of corporation taxes, they've hitched their wagon to international capital. And they've hitched their wagon to, on the basis that we're going to be a very cheap economy, or a, a very competitive economy, and latterly, a very financialised, neoliberalised economy. And so on that basis, the idea that the Irish ruling class will accept the three simple steps Let's, have private, let's move from private banking to public banking. Let's move from private investment to public investment, etc. It's just for me, it's as 
utopian as what we might put across as a socialist revolutionary program. So while I have a couple of more minutes, let's put forward the, the views that I think we should go for. First thing I think we should go for is cancel the debt. I mean, this debt is not just odious debt, this debt is bankers' debts, right? This is the class who exploit us using their political power to force the crisis onto working people. So if we want to challenge the limits of the capitalist system, it seems to me our first demand has to be we are not paying for the crisis of capital. We are not paying the debts of the banks and actually we're not even going to pay the debt that they say isn't banking debt because ultimately they crashed the economy. When we went into this crisis we had 25 billion of, uh, sorry, 25% of debt to GDP and actually it was 25 billion in terms of uh, in terms of actual money now. Now it's 160, 170 billion. So we need that cancelled if we're going to move uh, any way to getting anything like the kinds of policies that we get put forward. So in other words, if we don't get rid of that debt, these ideas of social investment and so on are just non-runners, I think. Second thing is, I wouldn't say nationalise the banks, I'd say socialise the banks. You know, socialising the banks, that's maybe just a semantic point, but the point is, socialising the banks for me, again, is running up against the limits of the system. From my point of view, you know, socialising the flow of capital into an economy is a massive uh, challenge to the power of the ruling class to control society's surplus labour and to use it for its control to make further profits. If we can socialise those banks and we can get rid of the debt, we're on the, we're on the right track. From there, then you need to go after the, 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 the accumulated power of capital. So we have said in our pre-budget statements that the effective tax rate of uh, about 4 or 5 or 6 percent needs to at least be the 12.5 percent that they pretend to tell us that the, the actual rate is. And we've worked out that that would bring in somewhere in the region of 4 or 5 billion euro extra every year. And actually we should put that rate up. We shouldn't be afraid, we shouldn't be beholden to the narrative that the only way we can have a future is if we hitch it to the ruling class exploiters. And actually in Ireland what you're really doing is you're hitching your wagon to a group of people who are glorified money launderers. That's what they are. The Irish rich are a shower of glorified money launderers. That's all they do. They take in capital, they clean it up in the most, um, the most uh, what would you call it? This is the sort of the most respectable tax haven in the world. It's, they pretend it's an economy. There's, you know, I'll just give you some facts very quickly. I know I'm running out of time. There's the same amount of workers in Ireland today in manufacturing as there was in 1926. Now, the bourgeois economists used to say, ah, but that's because we've developed, we've grown up. We're now a, a service-based economy, so we provide services. So what, the, what are the services that we provide? Well, for every three people who make a good or service in this country, you have one person involved in tax, consultancy, the legal profession and accountancy. So what the hell are they accounting for and you know, looking at legal loopholes for and looking at tax and consult? They're basically washing money. They're washing the money of the rich. And that explains, if there's 85,000 of them people, that explains why there's 109,000 people who still earn over 100,000 euros. So in other words, it explains it. Why is there so many rich people at the top of society? Because they're doing the bidding of the international capitalist class. So we need to say, effective tax rates on them need to go up, and they need to go up by up to at least 50%. That still leaves them, by the way, on average, with €90,000 per person or per tax unit after we increase their taxes. So, I mean, these are not you know, radical. This is not you know, run up the red flag. This, is, I think, would be a demand that could be won around. Very quickly then, just one or two others. Um, we need, a, we need um, taxes on the transactions of the financial institutions. Even the European Commission says such is the level of movement through Irish, the IFSC, that even a 0.01% tax would generate 750 million euros. Now, the idea that they will leave when they've got all those other auxiliary money laundering services is nonsense. Why would they leave? They need Ireland to be the, the tax haven that it is. So we can easily impose that tax and not. And anyway... <coughs> If they do redirect some of the money out, well then, you know, we can sort of put some controls on that. Imagine that, that we might control our own economy a little bit and have some democratic say over the how the thing de develops. So, I mean, we have uh, technical solutions as well, but it's very important, just as I finish here, that these are not solutions ultimately to the crisis. Because, you know, we can talk about this as an economic crisis. I see this as a human social crisis. I mean, ultimately what we're seeing is the absolute decimation of ordinary people's lives. We heard last night a million Irish people now on the breadline, you know, below the breadline. You hear all sorts of statistics. One in five Irish children going to school hungry. 200,000 Irish children in consistent poverty. 
This is not something that's amenable just to a technical fix that allows the ruling class to get the economy moving for them again and back to profitability. Ultimately, the solution to the crisis of capitalism is to break the hold of the exploiting class over us, and we need to have that in our heads as we move forward confidently and building organisationally to make sure that as we do uh, everything that we're doing from the march today to the next, week, next week's march, that we actually put the transitional demands in a confident way that tries to build co workers' confidence up that eventually we can control not just public investment but the whole bloody economy. I want to pick up on a, a few points, but just to first off, generally... Um, uh, um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to defend Keynesianism, you know. I'll use some of his arguments. I'll use Adam Smith's arguments, Karl Marx's arguments, I mean Minsky's arguments. Uh, I'll, I'll use uh, I'll, I'll use the guy at the end of the pub his arguments if it's going to advance my case. Uh, you know, if you want to, you know, have a criticism of Keynesianism, well. Bring in a Keynesian. Uh, I would say, though, I don't think it, that it is an example of Keynesian monetary financing. I think that would be doing him quite an injustice. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the idea that, that the European Central Bank gives one trillion euros to essentially insolvent European banks, and that's supposed to be a, that's supposed to kind of help the eurozone economy. Uh, Keynes would never have argued for that. Uh, what he would have said is give the trillion euros to the European Investment Bank who would then, in turn, reinvest it back in investment uh, 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 into the economies. Uh, second general point is uh, the four things that Brian mentioned, the four transitional demands. Well, yeah, I mean, they're all part of the Unite's program, my own trade union program. I mean, socialized capitalist flow, that's, that's one of the things I said. Cancel the debt. We're part of Anglo, not our debt. Yes, cancel the debt. For societies to thrive, debt must die. High taxation? Oh, well, I'm on there all the time. Uh, Unites on all the time. A number of other people. And financial transaction tax? I mean, really? I mean, it's just a tiny, tiny little tax. Even the European Commission supports it, as Brian says. And somehow our government shies and runs away from it. Those, you know, so those transitional demands, I guess I should have called my things transitional demands because I don't see a difference. Now, yes, there's an underlying analysis that, that we, we might not share. Or I wouldn't say not share, you know, because I'm interested in, 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 in building understanding with everyone. You know, certainly Unite is. We're trying to build the broadest possible platform. Uh, so I think that, you know, where we can share the analysis and let's try to focus on the things that we can agree on and move forward. Because when people work together, they realize, wow, that, that, that person's not so right wing or so extremist or so, whatever the kind of things you say. So um, I want to just talk about the trade union movement and bring in uh, the comrade here and what Marnie said. And this is being taped, so I'll. Be uh, careful. Um, um, <laughs> listen, the idea that people uh, will not take to the streets, will not demonstrate, is nonsense. Uh, back in 2000, remember, everybody, everybody remember back in late 2010 when we all had to stand in either ice or melting ice and people had to drive up from the country sometimes for five or six hours through the snow, 125,000 people, do the ratio, do the ratio, that's a march of a million and a half in London for our size of our population. They came out. People will come out when they are given leadership from an agency that they trust, they will come out. I absolutely believe that. Because uh, I know people, and I'm sure we all have had this, people, people from France and Germany and Spain and all this, like, geez, why aren't you people protesting? But, you know, people just don't go out on the street just kind of, you know, spontaneously. You know, there has to have to be, 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 be an agency there. Um, yes, the trade union movement, collectively, should be upping its game. There, that, that's, 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 you know, you can read into that what, whatever you want. Uh, I will say this, I was ashamed last Wednesday. I was absolutely ashamed as a trade unionist, as a European. There were, in Germany, Greece, Spain, Portugal, they were waving Irish flags in solidarity with us, and they were waving the flags of other peripheral, you know, countries, peripheral countries in solidarity with us, they were on general strikes, they were on half-day protests, they were on lunchtime protests. Whatever was appropriate that the trade, local trade unions called, fine, that's good. But they were out. We couldn't even wave one, the trade union movement here couldn't wave one flag here in Ireland. Now, now, 
let's, 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 you know, let's not smear a whole thing. Dublin Council of Trade Unions, in, uh, 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 in cooperation, alliance, in partnership with uh, Communities Against Cuts, Hustle Charges, um, I expect to to find, there might be a couple others, I'm sorry if I missed it, is staging a demonstration. We now have the opportunity to make good on what we didn't do on Wednesday. And I will march with anybody who's against austerity. And you, you know, you know, and that is the type of broad class coalition and politics that uh, 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 we know we should be building. Uh, just quickly, a couple of other points. Uh, how far can austerity go? Oh, it can go a long ways. It can go a long ways. I mean, the ministers must be just, you know, they can't believe their luck. You know, ah, oh, geez, wait, wait, we've cut here and there's no protest. We cut there, okay, there's a protest here and there's a protest there. You know, until we actually link up these things, 15,000 people in Waterford or 12,000 or whatever, again, do the ratio. I mean, how many proportion of the population of Waterford came up? There are protests here and there. We've got to find the agency, the platform, and the people who believe in a broad class politics, or sorry, a broad uh, coalition politics, not broad class, sorry, that was Fianna Fáil, um, uh, uh, who will work with each other in a, in, in a way of solidarity to, bu to, to, to build that. But it can, it can go uh, a, a, long, a long ways. Uh, two more things, and I just wanted to hit back on, I think, a very important thing that Marnie raised. Uh, first off, so a comrade asked, uh, uh, where would we find the capital uh, to put in uh, public enterprise? And make two points. One, of course, don't forget, in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, this was a desperately poor country. And yet they could set up all these public enterprises. You know, if you want to do this, it will be done. It depends on what you want to prioritize. Next March, we're going to pay $6.2 billion because of Anglo-Irish debt, 6.2 billion at the end of March. Well, okay, maybe a little shift in priorities wouldn't help, but I'll give you two things. One, the government is sitting on 25 billion euros in cash, uh, cash reserves and bank balance. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, NPRF assets, pension fund assets. That's our money, that's our money. Uh, it's been borrowed on our behalf, it's been saved on our behalf. Some of that is necessary for them to hold on to for uh, liquidity buffer and all that. But I'll tell you this, a lot of that's being saved on to, too. Pay the Anglo-Irish and to pay down debts of, of whatever that has been arisen that hasn't been caused by us. So, uh, and then of course there's the 80 billion euros that is held by pension and insurance uh, uh, funds that are invested abroad. Now I wouldn't mind if they were being invested abroad productively to put workers in, country, in other countries because I'm not going to get nationalist about this. But you know, my gut feeling is that a lot of it isn't in the productive economy. Uh, but of course you'll never know that because they won't publish it. You know, we don't even have transparency about where our savings are going, workers' savings. But there is money. I mean, I just do not buy the argument that, uh, that there, there, there isn't money. Uh, just one more thing before I get to Marnie's thing. You know, uh, uh, the sister here brought up the precariat. I mean, I would suggest to people, study that phenomenon. Look what's happening, especially in the retail sector, in the accommodation sector. Uh, the thing that the mandate's trying to fight, study that and look what's coming down the line. There will be a rise in the precariat. Uh, the government will facilitate that through the taxation system. It is a great thing to keep workers in place. It's an anti-trade union thing, but it's about fragmenting people. Uh, that, you know, that, is, you know, that, that is a phenomenon that we have to, uh, and certainly in the trade union movement, has to bring up high on the agenda. And finally, what are the forces? This is the question that Marnie asked. What are the forces? There are two, there are two broadly speaking, two forces. Uh, uh, first off, the trade union movement has to be at the heart of that. And as I said, we've got to uh, up our game. Uh, we've got to realize uh, that our members are suffering. And it's not a matter of just kind of trying to do deals here and there. But we have to mobilize that strength, which they've done in the past. The trade union has to do that. But here's the second thing that the trade union has to do. It has to work with other civil society organizations, not in a, in a way that actually works together. In, in partnership, and thirdly, and I will wind up, there has to be a political force. Uh, and that political force has to be created out of progressives that are now fragmented all over the place. I don't know how you do that, but I know this. There is a larger number of progressives in Irish society, whether activists or people who would support, than what our current party structure actually 
uh, uh, would actually seem to suggest there is. How you do that, I don't know. But I would really like to get into a constructive dialogue on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, the first thing I want to do maybe is answer the question on money, because people often say, is it about money and so on and so forth. And one of the things that when you read Marx uh, uh, in Capital, he consistently says is that capital is a social relation. It's a social relationship between a group of people who exploit and a group of people who are exploited. And I suppose because the economy is very complex, money mediates these relationships and you know, can take on a bit of a life of its own. Marx talks about fetishism, whereby the way the world appears to us becomes all about things, and if you control the things, in some ways you do control the human relations anyway. If you have a lot of control of the money, you get to control. So what I would say is having control of money gives you uh, the ability to sort of grab surplus value or labour from the system, but ultimately to understand capitalism, you can't understand it just on the basis of printing money. It has to be on the basis of human labour. Human labour is what keeps the world moving around, not pieces of paper, ultimately, at the, at the base of it all. And I suppose that's, that also feeds into the idea of the fetishism of where we would get the capital from. Because ultimately, what we have in the country is human beings that have creative capacities. We have, we have machines, we have uh, all sorts of technologies, and what we need to be able to do is find the social relations that allow us to move from relations of exploitation to relations of creativity and you know, human development. That seems abstract, but that's ultimately what we're trying to do. And so whether or not we have pieces of paper in a bank account or not, we have the ingenuity to get people working again. And when you get people working again, then you can actually have an economy. It doesn't have to be on the basis of capital. It has to be on the basis of a plan that can actually get human beings to produce for themselves and each other. That's effectively what it is. So demystifying the fetishism of capitalism helps a lot, I think, and gives you a sort of a, a different sense of how the, the, the capitalist economy works. The question on debt. Somebody asked me a concrete question about how we would look at debt. Well, the example I came immediately to was Iceland. If you think of what happened in Iceland, the Icelandic ruling class, exactly the same interest as the Irish ruling class, they wanted to make the bank bailout sacrosanct, they wanted to bail out the banks to crystallise the losses of their system onto the, onto the backs of Icelandic people, but the Icelandic people mobilised, 94% of Icelandic people said, we're not having this, they were on the streets, they had a pot and pan revolution, banging the pots, they you know, arrested politicians, and they actually cancelled the debt. So this idea that you can't, it's almost like, you know, the ruling class wants us to feel that these are natural constraints. Just like we can't stop the rain today, we can't cancel the debt. What actually happens is, as John put it very well, when you start to try and put forward uh, transitional demands like cancel the debt, you're, you're really upping the ante. And it's not surprising for me that in Greece you've had both some cancellation of debt, much more class struggle and a much more revolutionary situation. They go together. So in other words, you, you wouldn't just abstractly say, let's cancel the debt. It's, it, for the same reasons as I wouldn't say, we'll just have these three simple steps. It all really comes down to struggle. And this is where Marley's point is very important. The key for us as the Socialist Workers' Party is they're really looking at this not as a technical issue, but as a political issue about mobilising ordinary people. And we think struggle is the key to, to this. Now again, we can have a, a, a very, I'm happy to have a very constructive debate about how we get struggle going. But if you think about what struggle does, it gives people confidence. I said this before, you know, think about the concrete issues like we have in Sligo around home help women who decide for themselves, actually, you know, I'm disgusted that I lose my ability to earn a living because I'm a carer and this society doesn't treat care with the metric of respect it deserves. And I'm not only am I going to say it to my family, I'm going to go on the streets and I'm going to tell other people that I'm not happy about this and try and win their support to my cause. When you see lots of people beeping their horns, coming from the street into the protest, standing with you, giving you the space on the streets to say stuff, that increases people's aspirations. And it also gives them the confidence to go for another thing. So really, for me, it's about getting struggle going. How we do that, we should all... I don't have, unfortunately, the keys to that. If we did, we'd have struggle going. But I think that's the, the, back, the, the ultimate... And that really then feeds into, are the transitional demands that Michael puts forward actually going to be transitional to the kind of world that we want, and which June put brilliantly, I thought, in terms of, are we going to get transitional demands that transition us, in the best case scenario, back to capitalism? Back to a system of, you know, having a, a, a mixed economy, having private enterprise and public enterprise and a social value and a private value and these two interacting? Or are we going to try and use this crisis as a time to overthrow the whole system? And again, unless there's a massive element of struggle involved, I can't see those transitional demands leading anywhere that I would like to transit to. That's the problem there. In terms of the issues overall, I mean, just to put it in context, you know, 
this economic crisis has been a crisis which we all know about, and every school child knows about this crisis. They know, you know, you hear about crisis, 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 and the crisis is because the metric of health in this is profit, as I just said. So you only hear about crisis when the rich can't make profits off our work. That's the crisis. Because haven't we had 40,000 humans dying every day for the last 40 years? Isn't there mass starvation in the world? Isn't there three billion people who have less than two dollars a day? But that was never a crisis. 2005, six and seven, that, wasn't, that was happening, but there was no crisis. So the crisis is a crisis of capital, and we need to see this as a time to break our link with them. In other words, that their ability to harness our creativity and use it against us is what actually causes the crisis itself. But we need a solution which is about having the vision to see beyond that. And that's where I think, yes, we need concrete demands. We need the concrete demands. But I think I laid out concrete demands. Cancel the debts. Increase corporation tax to 15%. Very concrete demand. Um, uh, Socialise the banking system. Uh, state investment. Yes, that has to be fleshed out. But ultimately, it won't matter unless it's political. This has to be a political struggle, not just a technical struggle. So I just finish on the point, you know... That there is a sense in the trade union movement that there was always the idea of a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. I don't buy that. There is no fair day's work for a fair day's pay unless the worker keeps it all. And therefore, I'm with, I'm with Marx. Smash the wage system. <laughs>